Welcome to episode 20 of An Understanding. This one will be about James A. Garfield. Uh, I'm going to start recording these whenever and wherever I possibly can. Schedule's a little bit hectic, so there's a lot of background noise. My bad. Just want to get these out as soon as possible. If you like it, listen. If you don't, eat biscuits and enjoy. The year is 1880. The Republican Party is having their nominating convention to see who they can bring forth to become the next president of the United States of America. Rutherford B. Hayes, the 19th president, uh, recently and had is going to commit to his, I guess you could say, promise to not run for a second term. He will be a one-term president by choice. Now, that leaves a bit of an opening for the Republican Party. The Republican Party is really confused. It's a little bit weak. There's still some stragglers there um, from the old beginning roots, I guess you could say. Men like Ulysses S. Grant are still there, you know, and you have the the next breed, I guess you could say, of the the rising stars that will take the direction uh, of the Republican Party a little bit differently or possibly down the the, the continued path, I guess you could say, of abolitionists and equality, etc., etc., of, you know, whites and blacks. You know, they're still divided. You have the stalwarts um, who supported, you know, I guess you could say the the, the old systems, uh, probably a little more uh, conservative, I guess you could say. And then half-breeds who were the ones who wanted to reform everything for the most part. The actual, sorry, the actual Republican National Convention itself, uh, there was three, I guess you could say, leading contenders. The first was John Sherman, who was the Treasury Secretary uh, previously, that the man that this episode is going to be about, James A. Garfield, was actually working for, supporting for, campaigning for. I think he was actually the floor manager for John Sherman himself. The other two uh, that were going to be fighting for the GOP nomination were Ulysses S. Grant, the former president who had kicked the tires to an extent uh, at a possibility of a third term, although, you know, conflicting reports go back and forth whether or not he actually wanted to do it. Uh, I personally believe no, because of personally uh, just ill health that he was feeling at the very, at, at that particular point in time. I don't think he was really actively going for it. And then the rising uh, up and coming U.S. Senator James Blaine of Maine, who's going to be someone who's very important to. Uh, Garfield, Arthur's, and I believe Benjamin Harrison's presidency. Now, their nominating convention for the Republican Party, you need a 50%, more than 50%. You need a majority of the overall votes in order to actually get the nomination. A three-way tie makes it very difficult when you have three candidates who hypothetically and possibly could actually get the nomination uh, themselves. The actual convention was at a deadlock. 379 votes were needed for the specific nomination. And not a single one of them, whether it was Blaine, whether it was Sherman, whether it was you know, Ulysses S. Grant himself wanting uh, the opportunity, could never muster up the votes. 34 ballots it took. A day and a half of non-stop continuous voting. And then suddenly, something happened. 17 votes in the 34th ballot go unexpectedly to James A. Garfield. Now Garfield, he was a little bit dumbfounded to an extent, or at least, you know, it was appeared to have been dumbfounded. I don't think he actually had any malicious intent for anything like that. In fact, he openly stated, I am, nope, I don't want this. I'm not doing this. This is not what I want. This is not the direction that I want this convention to go. I don't want the nomination. But 17 people voted for him, and no one blinked an eye. No one stopped. And the truth and reality is is that none of these three candidates were ever going to get the majority votes. There's too much divisiveness within the Republican Party. They didn't know what direction they were going to go in, and everything's a little bit wonky, to be quite honest with you. So they chose a man in James A. Garfield. A lot of people did. He was a potential contender, but he openly stated he didn't want the presidency. So he threw his support behind John Sherman. Several battles continued. Many, many more battles continued. And he even said, you know, that in his own words, the announcement contains votes for me, 
No man has a right without the consent of the person voted for to announce that person's name and vote for him in this, conven in this convention, and such consent I have not given. By the, tw by the 35th ballot, 35th ballot, he would receive 50 votes, and by the 36th ballot, James A. Garfield even got the support of John Sherman, who came to a very stark realization he wasn't going to get the opportunity for the nomination. The 37th ballot, James A. Garfield had accumulated 399 votes, more than enough for the majority. People cheered. People were singing praise. Oh Lord, this is over. We are happy. And Garfield was shocked. And he felt, in his own words, that he was very sorry that this has become necessary. Now, within five months, James A. Garfield will be the 20th president of the United States of America. Now, the reason why this is significant and important is because there are many people who want the presidency. There are many people who basically do whatever they can to, you know, achieve ultimate power and capabilities. And I think anyone who really wants it, I don't know if their intentions are always the best or the greatest. And people will have conflicting reports on James A. Garfield as I get into this deep dive. But the truth is, which I believe is, with that the very least, uh, a reality, is that James A. Garfield never wanted to be the president of the United States. They forced him to become the president of the United States. And a man like James A. Garfield, who could muster up enough support for becoming the president of the United States without ever having any intention of doing so, I think is really interesting. It makes James A. Garfield one of the fascinating individuals in our country's history. James A. Garfield is going to be the country's 20th president of the United States of America. He's an interesting one. Um, the best I could probably put it, um, I think in the eyes of a lot of people uh, back then, specifically, he's in a lot of ways like a poor man's jfk at least in just the ideas um of who he was and who he could be like someone who can actually get things done because they felt rutherford behaves um he was politically uh, incapable of doing it for a multitude of reasons um and for james a garfield you know when, when he was inaugurated people black people started actually tearing up and crying that he was finally like someone who was going to be pushing the ideas genuine ideas of you know the i guess you could say lincoln republicanism um there's a bunch of uh, articles and a whole bunch of different things that he, he's like the last vestige of abraham lincoln if that makes any sense um and he's going to be a very interesting person to be quite honest with you um rags to riches kind of individual rising up from the bottom of the bottom to become basically the president of the united states of america he's also um one of these civil war uh general not generals but you know soldiers who would eventually lead uh public office and influence and point the country in a particular direction um and above all else he's going to be the second president spoiler alert that's going to be assassinated in this country's history now his assassination is very pretty rough to be quite honest with you and you know there's a million what ifs you could quite honestly do with James E. Garfield if he had to actually become president. Um, you know, because he, out of every single president that we've had in this country's history, he's the only one I can genuinely say just that didn't want to become president. You know, the Republicans and the people really forced him um, into this spot, and th into this position. They believed uh, ultimately that he could be the one that could actually turn the tide and change the direction that this country was going to be going in. Because you have to understand, if you want to understand James A. Garfield, you have to understand the era and the time that, it, that he uh, was a part of. The beginnings of the progressive movement, unions are starting to, to come awry. The rich are really leading the country in a particular direction that a lot of people aren't liking. And above all else, ever since basically Abraham Lincoln um, was assassinated, you know, for the last 15 years, you could say that the country's been in a bit of a civil cold war, um, if that makes any sense. Um, people still fighting... You know, the countries, because you understand, this is an area where things are moving fast. You know, within, I think by this point, automobiles are, start, are going to be starting to become a thing. The Wright brothers, within 30 years, are going to start flying. And then, you know, the, the amount of systemic change that's going to occur really begins here in a lot of ways. And 
A lot of people felt that James A. Garfield could be the kind of individual that could lead this country into a particular direction that was very positive. Now, my feelings on James A. Garfield are all over the place. I really don't know how I feel. And this is one of those episodes, just like every single episode, where I'm just going to have to really do all the information, just show it, present it um, as objectively as I can with, you know, let's be honest, a lot of bias. But, you know, just, you know, try and look at things from a different perspective. Try and look at them as honestly as I possibly can. So James A. Garfield, the 20th president of the United States, the second president who's going to be assassinated. Um, Let's start with his childhood. James A. Garfield was born on November 19th, 1831. Uh, rural County, uh, the, oh, sorry, the rural Orange Township uh, County in uh, near Cleveland, Ohio. I think it's a couple miles south of Cleveland, Ohio, specifically. You grew up in a really, really, really small village um, surrounded by a lot of forest. And he's going to be the youngest of... I believe three surviving siblings ultimately who'd be uh, babied for most of his, his youth. Um, recalling his birth, as his mother said, James A. Garfield was the largest baby I ever had. He looked like a red Irishman. And James A. Garfield and his family, just like many of the families who uh, would end up settling in Ohio, uh, came from you know the the Northeast Territory, the, the the New England Territory, I guess you could say. Um, you know, going from you know Boston, Massachusetts, New York, all those states and places, Pennsylvania, uh, when travel west through uh, the Alleghenies uh, in northern Ohio, and the financial upbringing of James A. Garfield initially is not very good. They were not very uh, liquid, as the 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 rich youngins would say today. Um, they had a lot of land uh, on the init- initially for the most part, but uh, didn't really do a lot with the land, and things were made very very difficult um, due to the fact that his father, James A. Garfield's father, would die um, about 18 months um, when he was initially born. Uh, he was actually fighting a forest fire, apparently, um, and would die uh, soon after because of it. Uh, his parents, by the way, uh, were uh, specifically Abraham or Abram and Eliza Garfield, specifically. Uh, James's father, Abram, uh, was a pretty strong, like strong man. He would die in 1833 due to pneumonia-like symptoms, I guess you could say, inflammation within the lungs itself, and. Um, it, or wet lungs, I guess you could say, because pneumonia is the wet lungs. Or that's what it looked like on x-rays. And he was a very strong man and a very brave man. Um, actually, apparently, he loved to wrestle. Something that James A. Garfield would really enjoy doing and really being manly. You know, men, am I right? Um, Eliza was a little bit different. She was much more reserved. Um, I would probably say aggressively religious, um, but a good mother. Yeah, she was very... Um, pure in every sense of the word some one book says that anything that approached impurity of life uh, speech to any degree was hateful to her beyond every single expression you know and she was a very strong and capable woman i mean she's gonna be gonna be strong because she's gonna end up raising a a couple kids um you know basically by herself for the most part So when James was growing up, he loved to read, loved to read all the books that he possibly could, loved Robinson Crusoe specifically. Um, He was incredibly academically capable, really hyper-intelligent to a point where he was being babied by a lot of his siblings, his older siblings specifically, who really pushed uh, the mother to uh, put him in in, in a schoolhouse to be educated by a teacher. And ultimately he ends up... um, Actually, they ended up being, building a school schoolhouse on what land they did have, uh, some of the acreage that they would donate that if she didn't sell it to pay off some loans, um, ultimately, you know, she donated it for other reasons. Um, one of the reasons was to build a schoolhouse on, schoolhouse on the land that they uh, uh, had acquired and, and just had for the most part. And, you know, if he wasn't working on the land as a young, young boy, two or three years old, uh, helping, you know, pick some berries and stuff, you know, you know how it goes, little, little, little things that the kids can do. Um, for the most part, he was just reading and really just being educated in uh, any way that he possibly could. And things were, were pretty good, at least, I mean, financially it wasn't good, but for the most part, um, love, some guidance and care. Uh, for the most part, in a strenuous situation, things were 
pretty okay for young James A. Garfield growing up uh, in the very, 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 very early goings. Uh, the early goings of his education really were, you know, similar to a lot of the poor uh, founding fathers and presidents that we've had in, in this country's history. Um, you know, maybe some occasional schooling for the most part, but, you know, generally speaking, you're working on the farm, working on the land, you know. And in, in fairness, you know, while he ex did excel in school, uh, when his mother enrolled him, because uh, he was an exceptional student, um, he basically had some other difficulties with other boys and had some headaches, some stomach pains, you know. Let's just be honest, you know, 1830s, you know, were not a very sanitary, I guess, time, especially in what's still technically, I guess, in a lot of ways, the frontier um, that's slowly expanding. Because, um, you know, this is around the time that... Uh, Jackson's president, uh, uh, Van Buren, which is crazy to think about sometimes that, you know, people don't think about, you know, like a lot of these guys are alive when other, it's like, we have probably like five or six, you know, future presidents born today, you know, and it's, it's just interesting to, to think about it, uh, and just from that perspective specifically, uh, but if he wasn't working, or going to school, he was uh, working on the farm. He he started working when he was he started growing up uh, on the family's farm, and then on neighboring farms when he was about 10, 11 years old to help make some extra money uh, just for the family. And uh, not a lot is written specifically about his early, early, early childhood. Um, it's just they kind of just like speed through it in some of the biographies and some of the the stories because um, you know he just had a normal childhood, just like. Uh, a lot of the Western Frontier boys normally would, for the most part. Maybe he was a little bit coddled, and things weren't very financially good for him. Uh, but for the most part, you know, he just had a normal childhood. And James A. Garfield, uh, he would grow up, and grow up being a very uh, fiery individual, to be quite honest with you. Um, very determined, specifically. Um, very kind-hearted, I would also say, too. And, and like I said before, intelligent, very quick learner. Um, he was very restless, to be to be to be fair too. Um, he didn't really take a lot of things seriously, which I think hindered him in the early goings of his of his youth. Uh, I would probably say. And in fact, uh, he would actually get hurt a lot sometimes because he didn't take things seriously or didn't take things um, as carefully as he probably should. That's probably the best way I could probably put it. You know, he was. How would I put it? Uh, one book says Garfield was awkward, lacked all manner of manual dexterity. Um, you know, he didn't. He never really used, ha never really learned how to use an axe properly, um, and ultimately ended up getting some gashes on from time to time because of it. Little things like that, I think, are always uh, interesting for the most part. Excuse me. And um, I will say this: uh, once he was growing up, he wanted to do something better. Didn't want to be a poor young lad anymore. Um, at least relatively speaking, things were, were looking up. Once he and his family were, were working, I think his older brother's name is uh, is Thomas, and Thomas was basically the man of the household. I think he's about 10 years older at that point than uh, James A. Garfield, and he wanted to be something a little bit better. He had a lot of dreams, a lot of things that he wanted to do. Um, some stories of him wanting to be uh, something other than farming. He actually wanted to be a sailor, I actually believe, at one point in his life. In... Um, Cayuga County, where he had lived in, things weren't, um, at least terms, in terms of prospects, weren't very good uh, for young James A. Garfield. He really wanted to, he, f first and foremost, you have to understand, you know, he's a man, he grew up determined like that, he's a very physically capable, very physically strong uh, individual, so... You know, he he at this point, you know, he's a teenager. He's thinking, you know, brawn over brains a little bit more uh, than anything else. At least that's his mindset, at least to a certain degree. And, you know, he wanted to make more money, have better wages. Because um, he got to he, boy, he's, he's about six feet tall, really broad shoulders, and just really strong. He's a unit, you know what I'm saying, fam? And he decided he was just going to do something else. So there's, 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 there's different interpretations but one book says he ran away from home uh, another book says uh he just bit his mom farewell but regardless he leaves and goes to uh uh cleveland and begins uh, a sailor's life that's what he always wanted to do really at a young age um specifically uh 
working on a canal boat. He would work for months. He worked on this boat. I think it was called um, the Evening Star. He would carry copper uh, ore to Pittsburgh um, from time to time, occasionally. And <laughs> it's actually kind of funny because, like I said, he was clumsy. He was not as capable as as he was, you know, to basically be a, a, a sailor for the most part. His mother, when, when she found out, was aghast, and she hated that her son left, which is really, you know frustrating for her and for Garfield because you know they have a pretty solid relationship by all accounts but you know Garfield was determined he was very dissuaded he was very very you know thick-headed in some way shape and form but you know when you when you have someone who's just as determined as James A. Garfield was you know it's, it's something I gotta tell you but ultimately um he was not cut to be a sailor he'd fall into the canal I think at least 14 15 times and then you know especially around that time cold water you get sick and you know he had serious fevers de- developing over some times and james a garfield just he couldn't hack it so after several months being you know a deckhand steerman and showing his prowess um you know he and, he and he could do a whole bunch of different things you know he could swim he could do he was a very capable individual but you know He's 16 years old, almost drowned a couple of times. James A. Garfield decides he's going to come home. He, you know, the the sea life isn't as grand, I think, that uh, that he had initially envisioned, or at least the potential life that he had initially envisioned wasn't wasn't very conducive for them. Um, when he comes home, he, he decides he's going to come home. He comes home. And his mother Eliza is like, "What are you gonna do with your life now? Huh? What are you gonna do? You're gonna go off, run off again?" And his family's kind of confused, concerned about him, and he's just like, "You know what? All right, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna be smart about this. I'm gonna go back to school. I'm gonna go back into my studies. I'm gonna start using my brains over bronze, and I'm actually going to be someone who is capable, intellectually capable. And if I'm gonna move up in this life, I can't do it with my body." Now, when Garfield came back, um, his education. Um, was pretty rudiment, rudim- sorry, rudimentary. Um, he knew some math. He knew some grammar. He could read. He could write. Um, and he was very hyper intelligent, in my personal view, um, and was very capable. But when he came back, though, um, it was very difficult, at least in terms of trying to, you know, restart his education. Uh, in a lot of ways because you know it, he had basically for like six months not really done any schooling in any way shape and form since he had left and by this point too 16 years old it's around the year of 1847 1848 the mexican-american war is ending so things are kind of coming back to a bit of a homeostasis and things are settling down within the country itself so his mother um put you know i think what 17 dollars in his pocket and basically was able to push him uh, to go to uh, meet with a whole bunch of different tutors. Well, first, she had a, uh, hired a couple of tutors, specifically mathematics tutors, to really help push um, Garfield uh, to at least be a- a- academically in- uh, competent. Sorry, man, I'm getting tongue-tied right now. And uh, when he was finally capable and competent, she pushed him uh, to, God, I can't even pronounce it, it Guaga Academy. Um nearby Chester County specifically um, which he could which he would start or I guess you could say restart his education for the most part and he would learn everything that he possibly could um, uh, mathematics English writing grammar philosophy really enjoyed philosophy and you know for him you know he really enjoyed writing he actually started a diary too um, that he would really have on and off for the next couple of decades at least until uh, his death um, he really loved specifically um, the study of you know old and modern languages. He loved just speaking in general. And he found out he actually really liked to debate people, and you know it really gave him some level of, of, of excitement. You know, it's one of those things that when you actually start learning and you start finding that little niche um, in terms of some form of education that you really enjoy. It's like okay, I can dig this. And for James A. Garfield, he really found his niche. So he would go to the academy, and he would. Um, basically just work, um, excuse me, he would both work and learn all at the same time. Um, he had, uh, intentions, uh, to go to college. I think he really wanted to go to, to, to Williams College in Massachusetts. Uh, but, you know, it's very difficult financially to both support yourself and, you know, he, so he started making some money. He worked, um, part-time, 
uh, as a carpenter, I believe, uh, and as a teacher on occasion uh, himself too. He um, working uh, for the local school district, um, uh, specifically in Chester, Ohio. I should also point out too that this is where he um, starts. I guess you could say, kind of getting into religion a little bit. Um, he tended started attending church a lot more often, mainly to, at first to, to please uh, his mother. But you know, like a lot of people back then, you know, he I guess you could say went under his own re- re- religious reawakening. I guess you could say he attempted and attended a whole bunch of like those. Uh, that sounds bad, but he's one of those people that back then would like be baptized in the river, be born again, yada yada, you know. And and I think he actually did get baptized in, in those spe- in that specific way. Um, it's also where he met his wife too, at Gayuga Academy. Uh, Lucrezia, Lucrezia Rudolph, uh, he, whom he would later marry, but I'll get to that uh, a little bit later. So, right after Gayuga Academy, he's kind of doing some soul searching. Like I said before, he wants to go to Williams College, but um, he wants to have an opportunity to go to a college in general. So he decides he's going to go to the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute, which is in a uh, Hiram, Ohio. And uh, you have to understand a lot of colleges back then, um, unless they were like, you know, the William and Mary's and all the big, big institutes, especially when you're still technically speaking on the frontier. Um, it's not a very good college. You know, it's not a very, it's a very poor um college for the most part really relying on like you know the county the people for the most part to help facilitate and pay it uh, pay for it but being one of the very few colleges specifically within the region um you know it was one of the very few places that actually had a lot of books um which is one of the big reasons why a lot of students would go there and people would go there so uh, james a garfield decides i'm gonna go to i'm gonna go to college and see what's gonna happen there for three years he's going to study He's going to study hard, and he's going to study very vigorously. I'm talking about a man who had really um, a lot of capabilities, but no intention to study. He's now just like going full bore into it, which is fascinating, kind of insane. Um, and you know, in, in colleges like that, um, in 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 comparison to the Electric Institute, um, really allowed you to study at your own pace, which is always good. So he wasn't like, oh my god, I need, like no deadlines or anything. You could actually like read a book at your own pace, and it's really good. And for Garfield, he basically just went full bore into it. I'm talking about, um, you know, he would wake up at you know four or five in the morning, attend classes for ten hours a day, occasionally maybe taking a lunch. He'd read everything: Herodotus, Homer, all the Greek and Latin that he could, geometry, et cetera, et cetera. Excuse me, and he would stay up until. Um, midnight um, usually you know candle it trying to be like oh this is what you know the Iliad is and all that oh interesting and he just was incredibly um, determined to really learn everything that he could um, and you know when you have an awakening like that where you know your own intellectual capacity is hungry and really just not satisfied with a whole bunch of different things it's beautiful and it's dangerous at the very same time. But James A. Garfield would spend the next three years there uh, aggressively looking and aggressively being pushed um, into the academic field. 